and we're back. And we are moving into our first conversation uh, where we're joined by the director of the Institute for Social and Cultural Research. We have uh, Nigel Encalada, and he's uh, going to be guiding our conversation as we learn more about the life of Dame Manita Gordon. Good morning. Morning, morning, Marlene. Morning, Isani. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Encalada. There's a lot for us to discuss, but first of all, let's begin with your knowledge of Dr. Dame Manita Gordon, either your, your academic studies of her life or any previous interactions you may have had with her as a young man. How do you know Dr. Dame Manita Gordon? Well, well, to be honest with you, Isani, I do not know her personally. Okay. I, um, but what, one of the interesting things I want to, to point out, and I think uh, Marlene referenced it this morning, Anyone born um, like uh, in in our generation, then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. me, we um, we would only have known about her going to school, mm -hmm. uh, being Belize's first governor general. So by the time 1993 comes around, when she, she succeeded by Sir Calvin Young, um, he is basically the person who has been in our. Um, in our, you know, in, our, in terms of our existence, in terms of the knowledge that we have acquired. Yeah. Uh, but one of the, I want to preamble, and the majority of Belizeans actually will not know um, who Deminita Garden is, but the only reason I'm here today is because I had the, the privilege of sitting with uh, her sister, mm -hmm. Kelora Franklin, and it is uh, she that gave me permission to, to be able to come and, and share with you this morning, no? Yeah. I, I, and so I was insisting that she come on, but um, uh, she gave me permission to, to come and, and share with her. You know, one of the discussions I had with her in the past week um, involved um, per, per humanizing the Minita, you know? mm -hmm. my own exposure to her would have been as a primary school student, um, where um, I would I had a, a fascination with um, social studies as as is still the case now, <laughs> and um, I would walk past like the, the spare office, for example, on North Front Street, mm -hmm. and these fact sheets about Belize and so on, you know, and, and read up about these these people and about everything Belize. So it fits right into to the some of the work that I've had the privilege of doing, and and sitting with people who, who have met some of these. Uh, pioneers in, in terms of Belize, no? Deminita Garden being one of them. And, and as I've had the discussion with Ms. Franklin, with Ms. Kelora, who you'll be seeing um, in, the, in the news and in the media as you broadcast the, the state funeral, um, she, uh, she was able to, to bring to life the person of, of Deminita, no? So we can, we can start there. So from a, from a social studies perspective, if we're talking about persons, Belizeans who define the atheists, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking, our generation here, we're talking people like um, Dr. Damonita Gordon, we're talking mm -hmm. people like George Price, uh, right. Philip Goldson, even right. Colville Young were some of the names that we were hearing in the 80s, right? Right, um, right. Dr. Right. Damonita Gordon in her capacity as the Governor General of Belize. And mm -hmm. when, you, when you look mm -hmm. at, uh, for instance, Independence in 1981, those are some of the names, as I'm saying, that were rising right. to prominence in Belizean uh, history around that time, correct? Right, right. Well, here's another thing to think about. She is junior to George Price. Uh -huh. So George, she, she passed away on, on the 1st of January, just after celebrating her 90th birthday. Just to put it in perspective, uh -huh. Price would have would be a hundred and, and two, I think, today, if he were alive. And so, yeah. just to put it in perspective, um, in 1981, when she becomes the governor general, she is junior to George Price. When you contrast to what we see now, for example, we have um, a, a governor general who is a, 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 a man who has had a long career and so on, no? and uh, all else are junior to him. Mm -hmm. just that in perspective. So she would be a junior to George Price. But one of, uh, it's an interesting uh, point to start with because um, one of the things that it may be realized that before becoming Governor General, she had a 
very extensive uh, career in education, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, she already had a full career before yeah. becoming governor general. And um, she would have um, been a pioneering woman yeah. because uh, she, um, if you've been looking at, um, had the chance to browse her CV, you would have mm -hmm. seen that she became Belize's first um, psychologist, no? That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She, a PhD at that. Yes. Uh, but, but one of the things that happened over the course of her life was that she was involved in continuous education. So um, it wasn't that thing where she went to school all the way, all the way through from her uh, primary school all the way through to PhD studies. She, she would uh, frequently get scholarships and so on to continue her education. Um, in, uh, first in education and then in applied psychology and then toward her PhD in, in, in psychology, no? Yeah. So she was a, a pioneering woman and a pioneering academic at that. Um, even before becoming governor general. So by the time I could see why she was chosen to be governor general, because by the time she um, becomes governor general, she is a well-regarded uh -huh. um, in the education community. She's very uh, community involved, socially oriented. Um, one of the, one, indeed one of the, the, the women who should be studied and examined, uh, her life should be studied and examined, no? Yeah. Yeah. But as, uh, as I, in the practice of, of being the sort of work, you realize that um, there's nothing new under the sun um, in, in, in Belize, no? A lot of what we think is new has been done by, by, by our predecessors and Deminita being one of them. I mean, so we can we can discuss any that, question that you have. We can delve into it. You I know? think you you touched on the thing that uh, resonated with me as I started looking into into her life. It was mm -hmm. uh, clearly in that time she was a pioneer when you considered the level of education that she sought and the fields of education that she sought, um, right. and and she also continued. Um, her professional life outside of Belize as well um, in right. academics in Canada. Talk about right. the significance of a woman making those achievements in that era. Well, well, that is significant because um, it, it's not like today where you have um, uh, children and, and young people and even adults being able to access scholarships at the rate at which we are now. Yeah. Um, scholarships were harder to come by at that time. But clearly, um, she was a, an ambitious person and somebody who was also well liked. And, um, and if I could give you, it may be explained through the eyes of um, Ms. Kelora Franklin, how that happened, no? Yes. Um, she grew up uh, uh, in, a, in a household of, uh, there were six siblings in all. Uh, she was the eldest and her mother was a pastor um, at the Church of God on West Street. I think the church is still there today. Um, but she grew up um, as uh, someone who they, apparently the they mother taught the, the children to look up to their older siblings. And she taught all of them that. And so um, some of the children, Colora, for example, was taught by her sister, um, uh, De Minita, in when she was in primary school. She taught her in three grades. Oh, wow. um, what happened was that as even within her household, what would happen is that when they would come home at the end of the day, her mother, who was also a, a highly intelligent woman, asked them to explain to her what they learned during the course of the day, as, as Kelora is explaining it. And that um, if the children, the, the three eldest, could not explain properly what they had learned, the mother would reteach uh -huh. the, what was taught in school, no? And that, that, takes some, that takes some doing for, imagine trying to reteach your child on a daily basis uh, what, they, what they may have not had learned properly in school. Uh -huh. So that was the sort of um, socialization that, that Deminita had so that when she began her own career as an educator, she, be, she became well regarded because she was thorough, she was knowledgeable, she was systematic in her approach, she was very detail oriented. And so she, among her peers, she was someone who <clears throat> was seen as somebody who could uh, excel academically and so on. And so over time, she benefited from, from scholarships first, um, starting here uh, in Belize at the St. George's uh, training, uh, training School for Teachers. Um, 
this is the pretty the pre predecessor to um teachers college, college mm -hmm. yeah. right and then um she she excelled at that she did short courses in in the uk and then eventually she got full scholarships to study at the university of Al alberta where she got her bachelor's and uh, master's degrees in um, applied um, psychology. And then she returned home and work, continued to work as a lecturer at the, um, at the, let me see, what was that? Let me see if I, I don't want to get that in At the teacher's college, was it then? Yes, yes, yeah. she was a teacher of, of teachers. And then um, she later on, um, went back. She got a scholarship to to go back to 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 get her PhD, and where she she did her work in in psychology. You know, yeah. but an interesting tidbit which tells you about the kind of person who she was as a human being. Um, uh, Kelora shared that um, Deminita was taking care of of her mother, for example. No, mm -hmm. and she received the scholarship. She. Um, she had said she said well, she wouldn't take it because she has to care for for her mother. So when she called, she told her sister that this was the case, and uh, she was prepared to forego the scholarship. But Kelora insisted on coming home to take care of of their mother, so that Deminita could go. No, so as history would have it, she went ahead and got her PhD, and if not for that small event in their family. She probably would not have become the country's first governor general. Not just putting it into perspective, yeah. was, was that kind of person that she was? Um, the one other thing within her own family, you know, she was she was well re well regarded, um, loved by her siblings, and um, simply because she was again her mother instilled this in them, and so they looked up to her. They looked up to to each other. But she was the one who throughout the course of of their lives that uh, assisted their mother with raising the, 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 the other siblings, no? Mm -hmm. So kind of um, person that she was, very, had a full, full career in education. So she started her career in 1946. Um, and as an educator, all the way through to, to 1980, to put it in perspective, that's what, 30, 30 plus years yeah. of being an educator. That's a full career for some people, yeah. no? Mm -hmm. Right, but she takes off from there and then goes on to become the governor general. But going back to this question of studying in Canada, apparently it also helped to shape her her social consciousness because um, she became involved in uh, in in work there as well um, as part of her studies um, during the course of her studies in working with mental health, in working with um, the the Red Cross and so on. And these were things that transferred to when she, during her career at home, she was a, a, a district commissioner in the Girl Guides okay. Association. Yeah. Um, she worked with the Red Cross. Uh, she's a lifelong member of the Red Belize Cross. She served on many, many, many committees. Um, when I look at it, I find it difficult to believe that a person could fit so many um, things into their into their time no mm -hmm. what it tells me is that she was um truly a, a belizean patriot somebody interested in the development of young people and one of the things that that uh that happened as a result of her studying in canada she set the the pace so to speak um uh she made a good name for herself and for belize and subsequently, when she came into the position of Governor General, um, scholarships were set up in her honor yeah. that other Belizeans could, could benefit from study abroad. And many, many Belizeans have benefited in that regard. Um, one of the things at home that she did was that she set up a scholarship fund uh, in the mid-1980s. Mm -hmm. She set up a scholarship fund in the mid-1980s to help um, underprivileged girls to be able to finish uh, secondary school. And again, just to point to the human person that she was, she would use, she would make um, toys and um, uh, she was skilled at leather, leather carving as well. She would make crafts and she would have set up her style as governor general. She would have a style at the um, festival grand market as I understand it. 
Um, with her leather she, crafts? With her, her dolls and so on, yeah. Oh, okay. That's a precursor to the expo, for those who don't know or can't right. recall what the Festival Gun Market was, right? Yeah, 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 that's a precursor. Very good, yeah, Isani. Right? Um, the, um, and so um, she would actually sell, she would actually stand at her stall and sell this stuff. And then she would use the proceeds to chip into the, into the fund, no? Um, of course, there were many other persons who supported the fund, but it was something that was there to her to see that young women who were underprivileged, but had the potential, would be able to finish their education, their secondary school education. And um, Kelora explained that very many of them have been calling her to give their condolences because they remember that she had done quite a bit for them, no? She was an exemplary woman at that time, actually. Uh, for young women to be, especially being involved. When she became governor general, she still remained as a patron of the Girl Guides um, in Belize. And so she was visible there. She hosted many events for them, um, hosted many events for underprivileged children at the government house. And so she was just uh, an all around outstanding citizen. Now we don't find them like that um, too often anymore. It seems that that generation is, um, that's of a generation gone of, of the past, no? Yeah. That generation of George Price and Philip Golson and, and um, Deminita, um, it seems that um, they, they were really, had a mission, if you want to put it in a proper perspective, yeah. where they, con they see a country that's emerging, they see a country that's moving towards greater autonomy, and um, they have this drive to contribute to, to, um, to the development of their country, you know, and they dedicate their lives to that. Not very many people um, do that sort of thing anymore, you know. Yeah. You, 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 you said early in the conversation that um, one of the things you realize is oftentimes they're pioneers that we don't, we don't know of or we haven't done mm -hmm. enough research to be able to discover the contributions as yet. Mm -hmm. What are some mm -hmm. of the, the, the surprising details that you have uncovered right. Um, right. from Damonita's life? Well, the one that sticks out for me is the, her work in, in education, her dissertation. Let me read uh, uh, the title of it, on second language achievements in primary school students in Belize. So what is interesting about that, it tells me, because I, I also was an educator, um, and I still consider myself an educator in, in a sense, um, but she, that topic alone in that time um, is pioneering. I'll tell you why. Because in academic, in, in, in education circles today, when they are teaching, uh, for example, English in school, there is still this ongoing debate uh, about whether or not English should be taught as a second language in school. Because the way we teach it right now is, is, is it's, a, it's as if it's our first language, no? Mm -hmm. When we know full well that English is not our first language in, in Belize, rather we speak um, uh, the vernacular, whether it's Spanish or Creole or Maya, or one of the one of the Belizean languages, mm -hmm. and then English actually becomes a, a, a second language. So this is telling me that she thought of this very early on, that um, English, in fact, probably would be best taught if it was taught as a as a second language, no? If it were to be taught as a second language, um, and this is something that educators still debate with even even today, no? Yeah. And so it's a, it, that tells me that she had a pioneering. Uh, vision uh, and thought so about this. I, right? um, I can I can completely understand why why that would be surprising. Uh, she would have earned her masters with that dissertation uh, in what the seventies. Yes, yes. So yes. you're talking about fifty years later. We're still trying to uh, <laughs> to to. Right. I know there are some schools that are right. doing this at at entry level, right. but it's still a very relevant topic for us here. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so that that is a. She, it tells me that she was thinking, she was thinking ahead. You know, um, in terms of her involvement in in the community, um, I didn't. She thought she was somebody who who knew her country as well because uh, she was a a principal out in Central Farm Cayo. She taught in Belize City and she taught in Toledo. So um, it it seems to be a, a trait of educators in those days. 
And um, Isani could probably vote for this, her, his father <laughs> being a, an educator. Yeah. Uh, that generation, um, they were prepared to go anywhere in the country yeah. to, to teach, right? Mm -hmm. And so they became knowledgeable, not only about the, the whole country, but they were prepared to, to chip in because it's not everybody who is prepared to do these sorts of things today, you know? Um, even though transportation is easier, roads are a little bit smoother and, and all this sort of thing, you know, but today um, not very many people are willing to, to, to take those sorts of um, journeys, uh, sort of sacrificing themselves for the betterment of the society at large, you know? I'm glad you use that, that word sacrifice because by and large, that's what it was. It was a huge um, self-sacrifice for teachers to be able to go into those remote areas and be able to deliver on education services. And as you rightfully said, um, my, my dad, for instance, he was educated under Dr. Deminita Gordon through a scholarship that was provided for him. So that's, that's, that's how I got to know of her, and I, that's how I got to know her personally as well. At Teachers College? No, when she was Governor General, okay. um, as, as Nigel mentioned, she set up a scholarship fund. My dad was a candidate, a successful candidate, mm -hmm. studied at, um, in, in, in Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. that's how I got to know her. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure right? there are many more stories like this. Mm -hmm. And it would be mm -hmm. interesting to hear from people who were able to benefit uh, from the right. scholarship program. I, I think one of the this things... Is... Uh -huh, go ahead. Sorry, this is one of the things, Marlene, sorry to interject. This is one of the things we'll do over time, no? because yeah. um, one of the things that we're involved with at, at ISCR, we have um, been over the years um, interviewing a number of, of persons who are regarded as um, pioneers and patriots in Belize. Mm -hmm. um, so this is one of the things we, we hope to follow up on, yeah. uh, having other persons who would have had interactions with her mm -hmm be able to get their accounts and experiences with her, no? Yeah. Um, by the time she becomes Governor General, it's important to think this too. She would not have been as, uh, she's not She's not a politician, she's now representing the Queen in mm -hmm. Belize as the head of, head of state, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So her interaction with the public uh, is, um, is not going to be in the same way that it was in her previous professional life where she taught so, so many people. So I have to say, for one of the things that I, I was told is that she remained um, very uh, community conscious. She would make it her business because mm -hmm. she grew up on Blue Street, so outside Belize City, mm -hmm. um, um, near to Crawl Road there. And she was keen to invite uh, her neighbors to come to the government house for, for various functions, you know? So she remained conscious of where she came from, right? Um, many times there's this stereotype that when people ascend to these positions yeah. that, they, that they disengage the, the, the communities and so on. That was not, that was not the yeah. case with her at all, at all, at all. And, um, I, and, and I'm, I'm glad you, you, you start touching on how life does become different when you are appointed to the post, but there are other, you can still carry through passions. Let me... Let's take a break here and, and talk about uh, the role of the Governor General and even look at how she came to be, um, become our first Governor General. But we'll take that break, and when All we right. come back, we'll explore that further. So please, Steve. Okay, sure, yeah. sure. And we're back and if you're just joining us we are continuing our conversation with the director of the Institute for Social and Cultural Research with Nich, Nigel Encalada as we learn more about the life of Dame Manita Gordon. Today is uh, day one of three days of mourning and she will be laid to rest in a state funeral on Wednesday and we want to take the opportunity to learn as much as we can about uh, who she was and the contributions she's made. Um, one of the things, Nigel, before the break that we definitely were able to tell from uh, the stories you shared is that she was very much uh, a pioneer in her own sense. Even in being named the Governor General, the first Governor General for Belize, she was breaking grounds in the region being the first Queen's representative. Let's turn back to that decision. Um, 
and help us understand how uh, the Governor General is, is selected and uh, the significance of her being the first female uh, Governor General at that time in this region, I should say. Right, so that is that is correct, Marlene. So um, she, at the time, she had the honor of becoming the country's uh, first Governor General, but in addition to that, being the first female Governor General in the Commonwealth, no? Mm -hmm. And so um, that in itself was a, a pioneering initiative. Yeah. Um, the Governor General, as you know, is chosen um, is by appointment by the, by the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And then that name is sent up to, to, to the Queen who approves that, no? All right? And, um, and then she becomes the Queen's representative, um, being that we are a Commonwealth country. Mm -hmm. um, we, the role of the Governor General um, is, is, a, is ceremonial, though so, de facto the Governor General is the head of the, um, of the military, no? mm -hmm. of Belize Defense Force. This is why you will see at um, all these ceremonial events during September and, and others, you will see that it is the Governor General who has precedence in terms of inspecting the Guard of, Guard of Honor. But um, I, in terms of piecing it together, I asked this question and um, the person who would best answer it, and maybe there are others out there who might be able to help, would be um, uh, George Price himself. Mm -hmm. But as I understand it, um, they, a few persons were shortlisted, no? Oh. Um, and through oral tradition, I've heard um, of, of other names that were called at the time. Mm -hmm. But um, Deminita's name um, was most prominent on that list, no? Um, and I am very, I realized too that Mr. Price himself was very conscious of um, the fact that Deminita was a woman, no? and that would uh, set, set a good precedence for, for the country. Um, the, so he was aware of these, these sorts of things, right? And um, given uh, it was also bolstered by the fact that she would have been one of Belize's most prominent women. Mm -hmm. both in the field of education and in being Belize's uh, first uh, PhD psychologist this were, and being community-oriented, understanding the, the society as a whole, these would be some of the factors that, that uh, brought her into this um, position. No? Mm -hmm. But in terms of piecing all the details together, I will probably still have to, to go into the archives to see if there's anything written there about how that happened. But I have uh, spoken with a few people um, who spoke of this process where um, uh, the, a few names were put out there and it was Deminita's name that, um, yeah. that uh, came out on top. No? And I think as, as we discussed in the first segment, the significance um, or all her professional achievements up to that point surely would have made her a, a right. recognized name at right. that time. But it, right, right. Uh, it would be interesting to know um, from some of the decision makers at that time um, because we were a young nation and, and making mm. that choice to, to select the first female uh, governor general um, right, is, is right. would have been really interesting. She was also yeah, they, this story. Huh? Well, one of the sto interesting stories um, I understand from the from Ms. her first younger sister is that upon the queen's visit, no, um, she the queen after the queen they, they stayed at the government house. Um, uh, the Got, uh, Deminita and uh, the Queen slept in uh, separate quarters uh, adjacent to each other at the government house and so on. And um, they developed a sort of friendship, no? And so the Queen said to Deminita that, um, he said, um, uh, Deminita, when you are no longer Governor General, for us to still be friends, right? And um, apparently that friendship um, uh, had been maintained during the course of her of her life, no, uh -huh. um, and uh, so she she was well regarded by by Queen Elizabeth as well, um, prob probably because of her own personality traits and so on. Um, but the, given the fact that she was this uh, outstanding woman, the Queen it would be the first woman that the Queen would have met in the Commonwealth, uh, who is representing her. If you think about it, you know. True. That true. Is true. Sure. And, and you, you, you kind of uh, moved past that quickly, but at that time, Deminita did reside at the government's house. That's that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. What that's we correct. now what we now call the uh, house of culture. 
Right. Well, the, the a new house of just so that the public is aware, a new house of culture has been built for the purposes of and the the government house is uh, supposed to become a sort of museum, mm -hmm. okay, a sort of exhibition space, no? Mm -hmm. It tells the the country's story and and so on, but that is still work in progress down the road. No? Yeah. Interesting. Another notable point is uh, that she had been bestowed two. Uh, distinctions, two order of distinctions. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to talk about those and, and what that signifies? Yeah, so uh, she, she I, if you look at her, let me just um, pull it up here so that I don't fumble over it myself. <laughs> it's, it's, not, um, it's not very familiar language um, to me, but um, I, in researching it, you know, so she, in 1984, um, she was awarded the dignity of a dame grand cross of the most distinguished order of St. Michael and St. George, which is called the GCMG. This was bestowed on her uh, by Queen Elizabeth in February 1984. Now what that is, it's an award, I was set, uh, sorry, it's an, uh, not an award, but it's not an award. It's a, an appointment, mm -hmm. right? That is made uh, by the queen so this order, and um, it is for ser loyal service to the to the Commonwealth, right? Mm -hmm. It's for loyal service to the Commonwealth. And um, by this time, she had only been Governor General for 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 three years, but um, she had done enough in her life that she was somebody who was well regarded, no? And so that um, appointment was made. Um, there is a, I, I don't know if you have the picture there, it comes with, uh, these orders come with their own set of um, regalia and vestments and insignias and so on. Yes. But she um, is entitled to wear, you know, being a part of this, what you call uh, this, uh, the, the, the royal household in a sense, no? Right? And uh, being the queen's um, representatives. Then the other one is the Dame Grand Cross of the Victorian Order. Um, and that one is for service to um, service abroad, service um, outside of, of the United Kingdom. And since she was the Queen's representative here in, here in, in Belize, um, she was given that um, award upon the visit of Queen Elizabeth to, to Belize. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what does it mean that she uh, mm -hmm. had received both of these distinctions? Well, Is that mean, novel in itself? Well, for the, as I understand it, for the, um, for the Victorian order, you would have had maybe eight or so women who preceded her, no? Mm -hmm. So the, other, the, the titles that are given to, and this is the Victorian order dates back to the late 18... Um, 1800s, sorry, no, no, dates back to, um, yes, the late, the late 1800s. And um, so you would have had maybe only eight, um, eight women preceding her. Um, the, the men are referred to, um, they're, they're knighted in as they're knighted, mm -hmm. um, and they're given the title of sir. And then um, when it's a woman, the woman is given the title of dame. And so this is how the name, the dame enters her, her official title, not her excellency, Dr. The Right Honorable Dame Minita Elmira Gordon. That is her proper, proper title, no? Mm -hmm. um, and then the, with the other, the other of um, St. Michael and um, St. George, um, that list is shorter from my understanding. Um, she would be one of only a few women who, who are in that, who's in that order, no? Mm -hmm. Who's been knighted in that way. These are so, very high, high level distinctions. Right. right, in terms of the Commonwealth system, no? The system that we currently belong to. So um, the, it is something that um, for, in the context of her time, um, it is a tremendous honor, no? Yeah. Um, it's a tremendous honor to have, and it is because she was well regarded in, in so many ways. Right. Um, one of you'd see she got <laughs> very many awards over the course of her life. And one of them I, that stuck that sticks out is um, um, uh, an honorary honorary doctor of laws mm -hmm. for um, 
for because of for in recognition of her intellectual uh, contributions and attainments mm -hmm. right so it was somebody who was seen as um, um, using her position um, to make change to impact change um, uh, somebody who is a pioneer again it's not it wasn't usual to see a woman uh, uh, in these positions at the time. Just again, just yes. to emphasize it being the first woman, female governor general in the Commonwealth at the time. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a usual thing. So it must have been uh, she must have been well regarded in that context. No? Yeah, absolutely. And and before we went to the break, you said one of the things that um, mm -hmm. that you noted was that she made an effort after mm -hmm. being appointed governor general to still ensure that she engaged with the community service that she was most passionate about. She still, mm -hmm. uh, she was a girl mm -hmm. guide going up. She then became, I think it's district commissioner of the girl guides. Um, right. At some point she was given a, a life achievement uh, or a lifetime membership, uh -huh. I think of the Belize Red Cross. Right, right, How right. Very often, th this role itself, as you said, the governor general, it's, um, what are the limitations as to what they can be able to, uh, how they can engage with the community, and uh, how did De Minita continue with this co community service? As far as I can tell, no, one of the things about being, especially for her, is that, and, and in and looking at Sir House, Sir Calvin Young, for example, um, functions in, in our society, they have the opportunity to to pursue their social interests as well, no? Yeah. So the, the, the position does afford them that opportunity. So for example, um, today, just to put it in perspective, Sir Carvel Young is a, is a patron of the arts and the Boy Scouts and so on. Deminita would have been a patron of, the, of many things, um, a patron of the Red Cross, a patron of the Belize Hospital Auxiliary. Mm -hmm. And this is during her her time as governor general and what it's it shows that her interest in her professional life carried over into her into her life as governor general so patron of the belize scouts association patron of the belize girl guides association mm -hmm. of the belize assembly often for persons with disabilities chairperson of the belize advisory council Honorary President of the Belize Rifle Club, Honorary Member of the Salvation Army Advisory Board, mm -hmm. right? And the list goes on and on in that way, right? So she was able to use the position to support these very important community initiatives. I don't know, I don't get the sense for argument's sake. When we were growing up, brownies and girl guides and Cub Scouts and Scouts were big deal, was a big deal growing up. Indeed it was. Mm -hmm. Right? I know that um, we wanted, I, I don't know if you and Marlene and you and Sandy, but I know I was a Cub Scout and a Scout. I know my sisters were, were brownies and girl guides. I had a brief stint in Scouts, but <laughs> nothing to really talk about. I tried to join the Scouts and girls weren't allowed to join. <laughs> I see. Uh -oh, uh -oh. But that's changed now, right? That's yes, it changed. has changed. I can say that. That's it has changed. Yes, yeah. that's changed. But the um but but what is because when you think of it really, uh -huh. it's because you have prominent people, mm -hmm. people of influence in the background supporting these movements, right? Yeah. Think of it um today uh, and that's that's what it is, you know. It was we, also to some extent a rite of passage because mm -hmm. you're going to primary school and mm -hmm. um girl guides and scouts were the thing like like as a boy you aspire to be a part of the scouts you go on camping trips and what have you and as the little <laughs> girls you go through the brownies and then on to the girl guides it's, it's a rite of passage to eventually right. adolescence right yeah. that's right that's right you feel um you see a very young you you see your classmates it's a boy we have cubs meeting this mm -hmm. evening and you didn't think to yourself what well, i want to be a part of that yeah. too i feel like i miss out you know yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's the at the root at the community level, there are people of influence supporting these things that ha that influences a society positively, you know, provides mm -hmm. positive outlets for for youth and so on. And she clearly used her position to support as many of these uh, initiatives as possible, you know, in mm -hmm. supporting young people in particular. One of the interesting things it reminds me of this, um, uh, Kelora shared that. Um, 
in her in her in her final years, um, she could be heard in her room praying. Mm -hmm. Listen to this. She could be heard in her room praying for the children of Belize and for the government of Belize. Mm -hmm. oh. How 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 tremendous is that? You know, a true yeah. life of service. Right, that's a true life of service. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You you can't that that I think that is a defining thing. You know, mm -hmm. that someone would even in 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 their final days still remain at heart committed and and mind and spirit yeah. committed to to seeing young people of Belize succeed and to see the government of Belize succeed, you know? That I think that's her. part of what makes her so revered and, and venerable. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. And, and the story is like, yes, go ahead, sorry. And some, I was going to say, some of the things you hear after is, um, after uh, she uh, retired as, as governor general and she still lived in Belize, mm -hmm. she was seen walking around, going on early right. morning walks, mm -hmm. Um, right. and, and still interacting with people um, right. in a very humble way, mm -hmm. which is, right. uh, I, I, we had a conversation with her first aide de camp that said, you know, that was, that was one of the things that he remembered as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, she, um, she lived a very humble life thereafter. Um, she had her, as I understand it, had her, she was fiercely independent too, by the way. Mm -hmm. Right, um, uh, because uh, she, chose to continue on living living in Belize, you know? Because certainly with a person of her stature, she could probably pursue to live anywhere, anywhere in the world. You know? But um, she continued to remain engaged. Um, in that same, uh, what do you call it? In that same, it seems to be a characteristic of that generation, you know? The, the George Price and Philip Goldsons and so on. Even the, 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 the people of the, mingle into the society. They're not um, some out there um, disengaged. You know, you see them on the streets, you see them at Brody's and mm -hmm. yeah. Kong, you see them, no? And that was the same thing with her. But what is interesting is I bet you that many people, young people would walk past her and not know who she was. That's yeah. True. yeah. Right? That's true. You know? but, that's, but that's the, the result of the generation gap and the, mm -hmm. the sort of disconnect that the younger generation mm -hmm. has from its past in terms of you know, who they, mm -hmm. their parents looked up to and some of those prominent names we mentioned. Right, right, right. Yeah. So what, one of the things we'll be doing, certainly, um, I, I know as a result of this experience, um, uh, we'll be, I know people will come forward and we'll get to hear some of the, the other more um, intimate one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, interactions she had. One of the other interesting things, I, I was speaking to members of the Belize Defense Force Band, you know, Mm -hmm. Apparently, she, she was a lover of music. Apparently, she played in a band um, while she was in Canada among her hobbies. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, she was. When I said band, I, I suspect it was a small uh, uh, ensemble or something because she played the recorder. Mm -hmm. um, but she, what she loved doing is that she loved featuring the Belize Defense Force band um, at the government house. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever she had any, um, any events there, she would make sure that they, they got over there, you know. Yeah. Uh, here stories like from Kevin Campbell, who's now a, a senior a, a senior member of the band. I think he's bandmaster. And then you hear from other other persons who that they used to spend quite a bit of time in, in the in the government house at the request of um, of um, Deminita because she was so fond of having them being able to showcase their skills. And one of the things that encouraged them to do was to broaden their repertoire uh, yeah. of music as well. No. Yeah. Yeah. So she. Um, I know growing up, I used to um, be fascinated watching, um, seeing the Belize Defense Force band march by, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it seems something, I don't know if it's because you're a child, but it seems like something much more, uh, it seems yeah. some, you know, to be fascinated. We're with, fascinated you know? by the pageantry of it. The fact that right, you have right. all these colors, these sounds, and the, the whole yeah. protocol and the order. It's amazing right. to watch. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And so I'm... And in and fact, we, we'll be seeing them in full form over the next three days. Yeah. Um, yes. That uh, as we as we have the state funeral coming up. Mm -hmm. Very fitting. Very mm -hmm. fitting indeed. This is actually, and this is an interesting note. This is actually our third uh, state, funeral state funeral as an yeah. independent country. Um, That's right. And so we, we've yeah. seen quite a few official funerals, and I know mm -hmm. um, in the recent funeral for uh, uh, David Vega. Mm -hmm. um, the it was the clarification was made because I think people mm -hmm. said state funeral 
kind of just uh, to to interchange with official funeral, but they're very right. distinct. Yeah, different things. Uh, and oh. so she will be laid to rest with full honor. Tell me from your perspective, understanding all the symbolism and all the reverence that's given to this time. What, what do you what do you look forward to seeing or hearing or witnessing um, in the next three days? Well, I I um, had the 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 privilege too of um, being near to um, being at the National Institute of, of documenting um, the state funeral of, of George Price. No, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I'm always fascinated with is the how people come forward to, to speak about the, the person. No? And I'm big on, one of the things I'm big on is giving people their respect, whether they're alive or whether they are have passed on. But especially someone of that stature, I'm, I'm big on, on that we make sure that we give them the recognition they deserve. Um, it's good, excellent that the media will be covering this being able to bring people on and to have them speak and so on, so that the public, especially the younger generation, which is the bulk of our country, comprises the bulk, the, the majority of our population, so that they get to hear that this lady who grew up on Blue Street, mm -hmm. outside Belize City, became a, a, a well-regarded educator and then would go on to become the country's um, governor general. And that any, any young person who aspires to these sorts of things, that anything is possible. Right? Um, and they understand this and that you you see it, it not only when the states when states undertake a thing thing such as a state funeral it is not only because that the state has the authority to do it but it's an opportunity for the state to show its level and of advancement of how it treats its own people mm -hmm. think about that right that is a sign, it's, it's uh, the equivalent of uh, uh, the funeral of Martin Luther King or um, the, these uh, in the United States, no? This is how we should treat our own. It's not something that's out there in the, in the distance, that, um, that's something that's done in other places. Yeah. This is something that we as a state, we do to honor our own. And I think that's an important message to send because a lot of times we think that um, what is outside is better. And even the honoring of our pioneers and our dead is a significant sign of how advanced we are and how developed we are as a society, you know, mm. right? Indicative of how we think and how we and view what comes from us. And certainly she was from us, of us, and uh, she. we have inherited the beliefs that she had spent uh, the, all of her life really uh, trying to contribute to its development. Mm -hmm. So we should honor that, you know? So I look forward to all the, um, the, the musical pieces in, in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I know this is not about George Price, for example, but um, I know Finlandia, for example, was one of his, there's the governor uh, Deminita with the BDF band, mm -hmm. right? Um, I know uh, like, for example, Finlandia would have been one of George Price's favorite pieces and um, seeing the Belize Defense Force Band play that, you know? Uh -huh. um, those small details that the state will acquire will also filter into the funeral program itself, no? Uh -huh. As a way of honoring her, yeah. um, honoring her life. Well, we appreciate you uh, digging up all this information and, and uh, sharing the anecdotes that you have been able to uh, obtain from those who worked with De Manita, mm -hmm. the family members, um, and people who were around in that time. Thank you very much, yeah. Nigel. Yeah, you're welcome, Arlene and Isani. All right. And uh, with that, we are going to go ahead and take a break, and we'll be back in a few. Stay tuned.